it's often said that creating a viable future uh, on the planet is as much a cultural process as it is an environmental one. Now, what on earth do we mean by that? And that's something that we really want to sort of tuck into today. And the question that we're sort of holding in our minds and that has gathered the teachers and also the participants on the course called The Art of Invitation is this notion of the role of the artist. What role might the artist play at this particular moment of planetary crisis, great timing, ecological collapse, however we choose to call it? And we could turn that question on its head and to say, how would any one of us respond creatively to these challenges? So those are the sorts of questions that have, have brought us together. And um, we're going to be exploring that in the second half of this evening. And we're going to be exploring it particularly within a frame of community and creative engagement for ourselves and in our community. Um, and we will be hearing from Ruth Benthoven and Anne-Marie Culhane, who have put the course together with myself and others. Um, but, and there'll be a, a, a small creative interlude between the two halves. So we will turn to the art of invitation and the course and the ideas and the energies uh, that, that, that are brewing in that this week here at Schumacher. But in the first half of this evening, um, as Rachel has already said, we're going to be um, watching a performance which is called Doing Dirt Time. Um, and therefore, I'm very delighted to welcome Fern Smith, Bill Ralph, and Isabel Carlyle. Three, two, one, play. following conversation was taped at my home in Blacksburg on July 20th, 1992. To me, art specialness is still a subcategory of separation. I think we need everything to become holy or numinous. Everything has to be equally holy. The mountain, the ant, the person, the blade of grass, the dinner, the sky. But one trouble I have with art right now is how it isolates certain moments or certain acts. If you're really living utterly in tune with a life energy, every single moment and every single event becomes numinous. And that is something that we've lost, that art supposedly addresses and tries to bring back. How has that attitude influenced you to stop making art and to burn or give away your sculptures? Do you want to give me the scoop on all that? Well, it starts so far back in South Central Los Angeles. When I first was there, I started having these images of people bursting apart, just bursting into flame as they looked up into the sky. You and Nostradamus. Yes, definitely. <laughs> I was working as a baker. And getting up at 2am and driving through these streets with packs of wild dogs and people living under the freeways and trash can fires. It was just like the end of the world. It was already happening. So at that point, you both decided to pull up stakes and go and live in the desert and do your art, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I made the images. So I made carvings of people just ripping apart, angels falling with broken wings and images of martyrs. It was a slow process. And I didn't even know what was happening. I didn't even truly understand it. And then when Rachel and I met, she was doing images of the hunter-gatherers, of the hunt itself, of the, the actual sacrifice of the hunter and the hunted. We knew we needed to get out of LA and move somewhere. At that point, it was we were leaving the city in order to survive momentarily and have a simple way of life. And to live in beauty. To live closer to nature. But now it seems as if all that has changed again, and it's another moment of total transformation, mm -hmm. just as that one was when I first met you. Were well, you actually asked that question when you were visiting us that time? Mm -hmm. And because we were saying how we didn't like the city, and we never went anywhere, and we never did anything, 
you actually said, then why do you live in the city? It was a great question, along with a lot of other things that happened to us at that moment. And, and we started asking ourselves, what do we want to have learnt by the time we die? Mm. Certainly wasn't how to survive in Los Angeles. And we weren't interested at all in the art world. Mm. It was the image itself and what this image was talking to us about, what it was trying to tell us. I don't have any problem in understanding that previous moment of passage. When you left the urban environment and went off to the quiet atmosphere of the desert to make art, what is less clear since receiving your letter is why you're giving up that beautiful place you love and why you feel there's no time to make art anymore. And not only the decision not to make any more art, but then destroying what you've already made and giving the rest of it away. I feel a sense of urgency behind all this and I don't really know the story. What brought you to this point? It, it, it seemed to me, when you looked at Rob's images, that they were um, about people sort of bursting open at the moment of death, like seed cases, ripping open as civilization cracks away. But the images in my work were what would grow from that seed if it had a chance to grow. It was a new way of living with nature, something that is different from what culture provided. So, we went out to live closer to nature, but we continued to make the same images. And we were surrounded there by meadow larks and antelopes and, and an immense silence for 20 miles in every direction. And where we live, it's real open, and you can see for hundreds of miles in a couple of different directions. And you have the sense of the earth as a living being that is so immense. And you're working in your garden and you just turn your head a few degrees and you have infinity stretching out in front of you. It is like a vision quest place. And you live in a relationship with immensity for long enough and you begin to drop away most of what you think is your personality and your culture. Because obviously culture doesn't matter at all in the, in the, in the great scope of the huge grand earth. And I think it has just lost its... Allure. It's lost. It's lost its allure, and it's useless. <laughs> it's all about separation. We went through a whole series of changes, just cleaning up the actual physical living of our lives. We got rid of the television, the VCR, the tape deck, the microwave we were given as a gift. We turned off our refrigerator two and a half years ago because refrigerators are monuments to ill usage of energy on the planet. Mm. It's made out of chemicals that hurt the ozone layer. layer. It's, it's designed for um, products of, <coughs> for, for dairy products, for, for meat, for the kind of vegetables that are raised and shipped on trucks. And it's all quite recent. Mm. So how do you manage in the desert without a refrigerator? Well, we cook dried beans and dried rice. And we have a small greenhouse and we, where we grow vegetables. And we have a garden outside for fresh vegetables. And we don't use much dairy. And, and we clarify the butter and we make ghee. And that keeps for four months in hot weather. And people live for hundreds of thousands of years without refrigerators. You're not going to dive your turn the damn box off. <laughs> well, we had these... We had these two huge barns built for the studios. We camped in one, we put all our sculpture in the other. And we lived in one barn for nine months while we built this little house. And then we moved into this little house and the living of our life on the land became our art form. Mm. When we were in LA, and even before then, I lived my life for my art. Mm. I destroyed relationships, my body, my health all kinds of things for the art. And that is the ideal of the artist in this culture. But living on the prairie in the context of the larger nature, that's nothing to do with culture. We started living life as an art form. It's as if washing dishes, if it is done with presence, is as much of an art form as painting a picture or, or making a sculpture. Did your desire to make the kind of art objects you made before simply dwindle and die out in you? It just faded away. Actually, when we were first on the Rio Grande, we walked down to the river, and when I stopped there, I immediately thought, I'm never going to carve another piece of sculpture again. 
What made that thought come to you yet? I have no idea. <laughs> it was there. I just knew it. I felt it. It wasn't just a thought. In retrospect, you can't see what it was, not no, then? Not, not then, but I do now. Mm. Now, I see that the art that I made in South Central Los Angeles was not art. Mm. It was a message to me. It was like being shown visions that came in strange ways. They had to come through my hands. Mm. So you feel you got the message, you got the teaching from your own art. And what was the teaching? The death of humanity. The death of our planet. The teaching was in terms of the hunter-gatherer, okay? So it was in regard to lost knowledge. So here are two homeless people standing outside at the point at which the earth is going to die. And one of them, one person, is just completely introverted. He doesn't see a thing. He doesn't even see the fire that's directly below his head. And the other guy is just ripped open, ripped apart in his chest, just spreads apart, seeing that moment up in the sky. The shock of that's what I felt. But at that point, I thought it was just something to live with or to keep going in this society. You mean how you carried the vision of apocalypse? The more we lived on that land, the more we realised it is here. It's going to be very soon. How did you come to you that it's so soon? Well, we left LA because we, we, it felt like it could blow up. The place that we lived in, I'm sure, burned in the riots in the spring. Yeah. A lot of your work, Rob, was about homelessness as a metaphor for spiritual homelessness. Mm. But you can't feel that level of disconnection that acutely without knowing that something is tremendously out of balance and that a system so divorced from what supports it is bound to collapse. So the knowledge that everything is in a state of collapse was already, already collapsing, what's got caused you to stop making art? One thing about art is that, all right, let's say that if we had another 40 years no. and we were to continue our careers, maybe some of that art would go out and be seen. But art takes years to come out, to go into the gallery system, to be written about, la di da di da. There's no time. <laughs> there just wasn't time. That's what we felt. No time. Art. It's also a closed world. There is a small group of people that look at art and who think about art. It, it doesn't move out very far. The general populace may stand in line for Van Gogh, but, but the art world is a fairly enclosed little world. Let's swing around to my generic question for these conversations. How do we live then in a time of decline and maybe even collapse? And what role does art have? None. No. No. <laughs> well, for me personally, making art was a powerful act. But it was a powerful act because I had no other access to anything more powerful. I had no access to making a daily life of prayer. But if you, if you can live your daily life as a prayer, it is inherently more powerful than going to your studio. What would daily life as a prayer look like? Well, daily life as a prayer is that everything is holy. You are holy. Everything around you is holy. Rinsing a vegetable in the sink is holy. But this is a quality that has been utterly lost from contemporary civilised society, which lives apart from nature and it sees everything as dead except people. And the dead world is a lonely world. But we live in an area where, where it's grassland and with that huge molten sky in the desert, you know that nature is alive. You hear one of those thunderstorms come and you know that that is alive. And it's like when you step on the grass, you have to thank the grass because you are stepping on it. You have to say, excuse me. But this is a kind of living that is so alien to us. It takes a lot of work to be that reverent. And, we're a long way from it, but I have an inkling of what I would like it to be. Joseph Campbell once said, we don't want to understand life. We want to experience it as richly as we possibly can. That's it. But I have no interest in documenting it. I have no interest in presenting it as art. I have no interest in even calling it art. My interest is in living it. 
So the price of re-enchantment is direct experience. You've set out to live the implications of your vision, which is breaking your cultural beliefs. And it's taking you beyond the traditional path of the artist. Right. Well, we went through a lot of trouble to get rid of toxic things from our environment. We still have a car. Yeah, that's a tough one. We got rid of the refrigerator. We got rid of the camera. We gave it away because we didn't want to use photochemicals anymore to promote ourselves. And that is the end of your art career right there if you have no more camera. And another thing is what I would call a toxic ego. You are asked to have a degree of separation and personal identity as an artist in this culture that is just as toxic as a refrigerator. I had trouble with that. I handled it badly when I had one. Hopefully you had your refrigerator better. <laughs> well, I, I didn't want to have a toxic ego anymore. I wanted to be separated from the separation. And I wanted to go back to being part of a larger family of living beings, rather than having to peek in the window. And, and I was tired of making symbols about something that I knew had to be true. I wanted to live it instead. You shifted worlds from, from chronicler to participant. Mm. Well, that, that's why we finally decided we take these wilderness survival classes with Tom Brown and learn the ancient art of living the earth, the ancient, reverent, daily life skills of the hunter-gatherer. You wanted to do something to break the patterning of your own thinking, to experience a form of reality other than our particular cultural trance. Well, we just recently learned any, some things that any eight-year-old Neanderthal... Ooh, a five-year-old. We are more ignorant than a five-year-old Neanderthal yeah. child. Yeah. We are so ignorant. <laughs> and between the two of us, we have four degrees. Four. <laughs> Hey, wait a minute, let's be fair. We're ignorant because those things have not been relevant to the lifestyle and set of behaviours that we're using in modern life. Well, that's why we're here in this place of feeling the end of the earth. Because we don't use those skills. And the skills were not just physical, they were spiritual. What is it you learn from the tracking? Well, he guarantees that after just the standard class, you can survive anywhere in North America any season, any terrain, with nothing. No equipment, not even a knife. But survival is just the beginning. For him, it is an opening for another way of being. The skills and the knowledge enable you to live so directly with the earth that you can experience completely that your life comes from the earth. One of the things that he teaches is that if you go through learning these physical skills and start to become more aware of your world, you will really get an understanding that you will never hurt the earth again. You won't take the earth for granted. It's not just a, a physical way of surviving out there in the wilderness. It brings you further into being a part of all the things that are there. We've been reading Brown's books ever since Los Angeles and we tried to do the things that were in his books all through those years in the, that we were living in the desert. So you're de-escalating from technology, something that came out of reading him? No, not that. He, he never said anything about that. Well, he was teaching ways of walking, hmm. ways of opening your vision. The dynamics of meditative looking and moving into the landscape, where your perception comes out of the landscape rather than at it. But at the same time as we were losing some of the accoutrements of civilization, we were adding in what little bit that we could figure out of these ancient skills from the books. For instance, we made fire from a bow drill and we, we constructed it from special sticks that we found in the woods. You create friction by working the bow drill and then with a little bit of dried grass and sunshine for tinder, you blow on it until it bursts into flame. You make fire with your own breath and it is incredibly magical. It's primary magic. But at one, t at one point, we got some um, tendons to make a, 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 si a sinew back bow. And they're very, very useful in a survival situation. They make the strongest cordage that you can come by. They are really powerful. And they come from the part of the muscle that provides the tension on joints. And we went to the slaughterhouse to get a few tendons to dry in order to learn about this material. 
But the only way you could buy them in Albuquerque was by the £25 box. <laughs> and Achilles tendon. Only Achilles tendons. Who's the cow? Uses Achilles tendons. Well, the Japanese eat them. But, well, no one knows how, but well, anyway, we bought this, this box, £25 box of Achilles tendons home. They're very, very rubbery and tough, and they're really scary to clean with a knife because it's very easy to slip off them. And they were from cows, and they weren't clean. What did you do with them? Well, first of all, we dried them, and then we tried to make a sinew back bow. As in bow and arrow? That you produce to shoot game animals with in the hunt? Yep, yep, to learn how to do it. Did you bring the bow to the tracking class? Did you show it to Brian? No, no, he doesn't want to see our bow. Well, also, it didn't really work. <laughs> no. <laughs> it didn't work? How many tens did you use to make the bow? Uh, six or seven. seven. What did you do with the other 20? Well, I uh, used them in a sculptor class I gave for a couple of weeks. I showed the students how to make cordage out of them by pounding out the fibres. But you know, when we first told our friends in LA in the art world that we were giving up the work, that we were giving it away, we got a lot of letters back. What kind of responses did you get? Well, from some of the art people, a horrible response. And from others, really great support. But one of the things that I noticed with some artists is that there is this horror that life outside of art is hideous, so appalling, so dismal, that the only thing that gives one hope is being in the studio. But all I could say was that when we decided to cut loose and really give this other stuff away, all kinds of things started happening to us. Opportunities, new people, and we have met more new people since we have decided to put our house on the market and give our art away than we've met in probably years, just in a couple of months. And it felt that, that that sense of discovery and newness and unexpectedness and vitality that I always associated, uh, associated with studio time is now lifetime. But when we first started to sell the house, and we decided to be real quiet about what we were up to, we were very vague, we were, for instance, with the real estate ladies about what we were up to and with the people that we bought the land from. But then, at a certain point... We started talking. Mm, well, it just seemed like it was more important to say, I mean, the world, the earth is dying. <laughs> Human beings have to change how they live with the earth. And they have to change it soon. It felt that it was more important to say that. And if people thought that we were weird, then that was okay. But more people have said, gee, what I think what you are doing is wonderful. I wouldn't have the courage personally, but I'm glad you're doing it. But when we finally came out of the closet... We're actually planning to totally leave the money culture then, live without money. The basic plan is to sell the house and so we can pay off the mortgage and then we're just going to mm -hmm. live someplace as simply as we can. <coughs> We've already put a lot of deposits down on Tom Brown's classes. Even before we went to the first one, we just had this feeling that this was it, you know? We've also realised that you just don't need all this stuff that we live with today. You don't need to have a mortgage, to have a house that keeps you warm. You don't need to have this infrastructure in order to have food. There is enough food out there in the wild to feed us if we are able to live with the earth. So, we've got a lot of classes to learn, as many as he's going to allow us to take, and then we'll keep the rest and live simply and... Practice the skills. He calls it dirt time. Hmm. You find tracks and you follow them. We all went outside and we did it. We even saw deer tracks in the gravel. And this is just after one week of being exposed to the concept. Being exposed to the fact that you can see these things, that they exist out there. But you don't, you don't need a clear track in the mud. But that's why I say it's like art. It is like pattern recognition. I'd heard for years that in other cultures, the things that are now called art in this culture were part of daily life. But this is one doorway into that. Tracking utilizes a huge amount of what art has been about, only it's not a specialized separate activity. It is something that allows you to be closer to nature and to and to realise that it all comes from nature, it all comes from the earth. 
and we just rearrange things obsessively. Now we see tracks everywhere. Yes, and everybody can learn how to do it. It's amazing. <coughs> you do have to do dirt time. Mm -hmm. Dirt time means putting your nose to the ground. We're just looking at this book here, the one I brought earlier. It says, book, this deals with the many reasons why we should come out of the wilderness and why. The decision to leave a life of purity, mm -hmm. enter a world that is impure, mm -hmm. to move from the spiritual rapture is one of the most difficult choices a person can make in his or her life. Mm -hmm. The question I'm most often asked by my students is, how can I take what I learned here in the wilderness into back into society? How can I continue to live what I found in the purity of creation? I guess my question is, how is being able to recognize the deer, whether the deer had a full bladder or an empty bladder when it passed by, how is that going to really help you live in society today? Mm. Tracking isn't not one thing. It's a part of awareness and being aware mm. of our world. Mm. Most people's lives as they're currently being lived don't have any deer or deer tracks. Okay, you'll find tracks anywhere. One thing that Brown did for a number of years was that he stalked in New York City. Mm. He would hide in the crevices and the little corners of buildings in the city and he watched homeless people. Mm -hmm. He watched people going to work. He watched everything, everybody. Foxes, raccoons. Mm -hmm. He watched people going to work and he watched foxes at the same time. At night, he saw foxes. Mm -hmm. He'd follow snakes and possums in the city. Mm -hmm. He said he found all kinds of things. Of course, that's one of the skills that you're taught at the school, stalking. And all of that is a part of awareness. You can't stalk without being aware of everything else around you. It's so what you're really trying to do to use your brain differently. Mm. Get out of that pattern of focused, fixed vision. This exists in space in front of me. I know where it is, I know what it is. Rather, this is movement. Flick of the tail out of the corner of your eye. When you shift like that, you can catch all kinds of movement at the corner. But the thing about the full bladder and the deer is... Um, How is that relevant to modern life? Well, it is, it's the idea that other creatures are living and complex. If you can look at a single deer track and you notice that the deer paused, notice that the deer turned, what it might have looked at, whether it is troubled, whether it is at ease, it allows you to extend what I would call your heart, out to that creature. That shamanic vision, I guess that's what is meant when they say the shaman becomes the animal, becomes the tree. Exactly, really becomes it. It is a participatory world. Brown says that as you go along in tracking, if you really get into it, you will be able to see the deer make that track. So in a sense, this is developing the deepest level of empathy. Yeah. Yes, very definitely. And that is the irony of it. Because a lot of environmental people probably would be horror-stricken if I said I want to learn to hunt. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, if you have to viscerally take a life to support your own life, you're hardly going to go out and do it excessively. I mean, if you feel it, if you really feel the gift of another life, you are only going to take it when you absolutely need it. And you're going to make sure that you utilize absolutely everything about it to honor the spirit. You're putting all that you have, spiritually and economically and psychologically, into these tracking courses in order to learn these things then, or to actually try and live this life? To learn the skills that go with the feelings. To some extent, we've already accessed them in, in some ways on our own. I mean, we came to this with an affinity for it. And someday, to live it, yeah. When you say live it, do you want to live the life of the, life of the hunter-gatherer? Yes. Actually, I would love more than anything to be allowed to do it. Well, we, we got to the point in the book where it says you have to come back into society and try to help. And we said, oh... God, oh shit, do we have to? I mean, we, we, selling the house, that's put us back into society. Giving the art away, that's put us back into society. We were very comfortable out there, living without anybody around. What was it 
economic pressure or spiritual pressure that drove you out? It was spiritual pressure. We wanted to learn more than we could have just from reading the books. It's interesting because when I started these conversations, I didn't have anything more in mind than let's just do this. Let's open up the dialogue as a way of blending energy. But already certain things are beginning to come through. It's Mendel's time spirit idea. You can become a vehicle for certain things that need to be said, just by opening yourself up and allowing the conversation to take place. Mm -hmm. You let the spirits talk through you and take you to that place where the forbidden communication stops being forbidden. As an artist, you always think that you have to have a product. So as soon as it wasn't going to be a sculpture, it became very convenient to tell our family and friends that we were going to write a book, because they'd understand that. And, and there was this terror that we wouldn't be doing something that was along that line. But the kind of interactions that we've had with people just since starting to sell the house and talking to the people that we gave the pieces to, it seems like human face-to-face -face communication is I wouldn't call it our art form, but it, it's apparently what we do now. <laughs> well, we live in a culture where most of the information comes removed in movies, television, books, whereas, say, almost all of the wisdom in the Upanishads say that you must have direct communication with the master. You can't learn this without a direct transmission from another human being. To some extent, we have lost direct transmission in our culture. Talking only to one person is not enough. You must reach 10,000 people or 40,000 people or whatever. But suddenly, now a conversation with friends, it is like spreading pollen. There's also the living quality that James Hillman talks about. Talking is a living art. <coughs> you love for the interruptions and the unexpected turns. You don't try to monitor or edit. Mm. You can be artful, artful, artful afterwards, somewhat in how you shape it. But what you don't want to lose is the vibrancy of the moment, the intensity of the conversation that, that, that it has, very different from something that's been thought about over time and then talked about. Conversation has another quality. I never imagined that even a writer could work interactively in this way. Well, it's a lot like tracking. You don't know at first <coughs> what is ahead on the trail. Brown's teacher, um, Stalking Wolf, who he called grandfather, mm. said that the ground is like a manuscript, constantly being rewritten by the movement of feet, wind, rain, leaves, instead of by letters. One of the main reasons that we are so interested in working with Brown is that what he inherited from grandfather is not culture-specific. It's more the essence of what some of the Native American cultures were about. And grandfather was an Apache, but he, he wandered alone for 60 years, up and down all of North America on foot, meeting and studying with a lot of people, elders from many different tribes. But we put together a kind of essential core of the spiritual attitude without all the custom laid over it. But as we got rid of our art, one of the biggest things that we were doing by stepping away was letting go of external symbols and going for the energy at the core. But what Brown presents is just the core of that reverent attitude. And he has a quote in one of his books, it's a Chinese proverb, and it says, Seek not the ways of the men of old, seek instead what they sought. It is that idea of going to the essential human skills for living on this planet, the very base, in a basic reverent way of living with the earth that we are after, rather than having to jump into a whole other culture. But we have to have the right skills in order to live simply from the heart, without propping ourselves up, without all of the things that have become so destructive. But in many ways, Learning these skills is essentially a prayer that you're offering, a prayer that this becomes the way of life again on the earth. Hunter-gatherers are the apex of human civilization. We need to go back to that point. All else is a bastardization and a plague. 
We can't assume what is comfortable for society, pick and choose. You've got to do it all the way, or not at all, or we die. what, who, why, how, etc. So, keeping in mind your reactions, which we'd love to hear, <laughs> can I just give you a, a teeny bit of context, so you know, so you know the ground and you know where you are. Uh, was everybody clear how we were doing that? No. Um, we recorded an interview, um, which uh, is in this book by Susie Gablick played wonderfully by Isabel for us. Uh, Susie Gablick is an art critic who lives in the States. Uh, and this book was published some 20 years ago. Uh, the interview was with Rob and Rachel Olds, or Rachel Sutton and Rob Olds, as they then were. Um, and the context of that interview, we hope you gathered from the interview, uh, that they uh, gave away their work. And uh, on the introductory tape that not many of you heard as you were coming in, um, they, the, the next time Susie Gabby tried to contact them, there was no <coughs> reply to the number and they left no forwarding address and they simply appeared to disappear off grid. Um, we recorded that interview, Fern and I, with a friend of ours, and we were speaking simultaneously to it. So Isabel had heard, I think, the first five minutes. <laughs> It just feels important to, to, to really set the context to actually say that they're not us, we're not them. Uh, and actually, it, it's important that we actually got permission from Susie Gablick to do it. Because it did seem this sense, actually, again, about taking other people's words, especially when the words were like this. It kind of felt like what I think we were asking to do was to be part of the conversation. Um, so that's what it feels that we've been doing very much is to is to replicate this conversation in the spirit of just including more people in it. Um, and so we've we've actually done it about fifteen times now over the course of about a year or so. Each time we've done it, we've had a different Susie. Sometimes we've had a male Susie, so so that's been nice as well. Uh, and it's always been in the spirit of this kind of sense of pollination kind of and and and, and again I mean, the, the smallest audience we've done this to is in a cow shed um, in uh, uh, above Aberystwyth to a woman and a baby it was a cow shed that had been turned into a theatre not just a cow shed so there was no cows in there um, but that was our smallest, smallest audience and 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 actually this is probably this one of our biggest audiences great. so so again there's this this sense of actually when there's a small certain there's a small group of people gathering together, that's where the conversation can be. Yeah. So, we'd really just love to share some reactions, some thoughts that bubbled up for you from what you heard. Please just jump in. I'd, I'd like to know whether you feel it more strongly every time you perform it. Do you, do, you know, is there any part of you that wants to go and do that? <laughs> if I say that two, uh, two years ago when we started doing this, I would never have been to Schumacher. <laughs> nor would I have contemplated coming to Schumacher. Fern, Fern had come to Schumacher. Uh, Lucy knows me uh, uh, as well and would know that that's the truth. You wouldn't have caught me within a million miles of this place. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, fear of change. Fear of change. Oh, Schumacher re represents change. To me. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Out, out of the comfort zone, I think, maybe. But there is something about that... And maybe we didn't really realise this, first of all, we did it for the first time. So my theatre company, Volcano Theatre, which I started 25 plus years ago, so we're a touring theatre company, kind of touring internationally, Arts Council funded. We made shows and we toured them. I mean, they were, they were shows which really, I, I always felt, were about social change, but they were very much within that, that, that very particular, specific tradition of making a show and touring in either a studio theatre or a big theatre. Um, and, and we had a 25th 
the birthday party kind of anniversary festival that, that we organised in Swansea for our theatre company, commissioned seven new pieces. This was one piece that I wanted to do, um, just because I'd read it and, and I remembered the interview so much. I mean, you know, I'm sure everyone has those pieces that they, they read and it's almost like that they just go boom, straight in and you don't necessarily know what impact they're going to have on your life. But it's almost like you have to return to those pieces to kind of um, chew them over a bit. So this gave us the first opportunity within the context of the 25th birthday celebrations of our theatre company. And we never thought that we would do it again and again after that. But it's just, yeah, so actually we're changing each yeah. time just as much as, you know, if there's any impact on, on the people who are listening to it, mm. it's also impacting us because we are listening to it all the time. And that, that is, yeah, it's very different. It's like pollination that yeah. you're talking about. Yeah, and well, we've never, we, we've never rehearsed it, we've just done it, you know. So we've done it many more times than Isabel, but we've just, we just do it without, yeah. Any other yeah, thoughts or... <laughs> So you were desperate. Uh, well, what, what do you feel at the end of the when people applaud? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What's the question? What, how, what do we feel at the end when people applaud? Mm. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Glad we got through it in one piece. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like riding a moving train. It is, it is interesting. I mean, I wonder if that's a question for you, Isabel. Um, because maybe that that's different for both of us, or all of us, actually. I love the sense of being carried into unknown territory. <coughs> Obviously, Phil and Fern have done this lots of times. But the whole process for me, um, I kind of really became Susie Gavlik in a way, because I could understand the way her mind was beginning to work, and the questions she was asking and the references she was drawing on. And uh, it was just kind of really amazing to step into someone else's mind. Mm -hmm. and, be, be inside that yes and there's there's something about the applause which almost i mean it is it's interesting because i suppose it's fourth wall theater really we're sticking our earplugs in and then we ignore you you know we might kind of look out here if we're going oh i'm looking into the sunset or the horizon but it's very much so, so i think this is what what we're kind of interested we know we're making a piece of theater we are making a piece of art about a dialogue that says, don't make art anymore. <laughs> yeah. so, so we're also interested in those contradictions and in that paradox. And in some ways, it's a very traditional piece of theatre. There's three yeah. actors. We, we sit here. We don't look at you. We play to each other. Yeah, so it's, it's kind of very old-fashioned in, in some way. And then we look out and we take a, and then we get applause. So uh, I, I kind of like that, that element of being within the convention of theatre, that of course the applause, I mean, we don't have lights down or anything like that. And, and, and I think that's something that we really wanted to do as well, to also get away from either touring in a transit van or touring in an articulated lorry, which I think some of us have done, um, or touring in an aeroplane. So again, this was this sense of how can we maybe still engage in our art, still engage in theatre that, that we have at this kind of interesting love-hate relationship with, but how can we also not just tour in a suitcase, but actually tour with our stuff in our pockets? And, and of course, we're using iPhones. We're well, also so. mindful of the fact here some people have shed all technology and we're using <laughs> the yeah. key piece of technology mm -hmm. of our age. Yeah. to deliver it. And it's also felt important that we don't hide this. <coughs> we have had that conversation about going, oh, should we do it on some old tape recorder that's like, you know, real to real, and we have big headphones, this big, <laughs> <laughs> pretending we're in the 70s or something like that, yeah. um, maybe, or, or in the 90s when the interview was first done. But again, I think it is, it's kind of that playing with the edge. Mm. Anybody else? Please. Yes. Um, because of that contradiction, you're making a piece of art well, about people who've said there's no art. Does that mean that you disagree with them? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, shall I say for me? Go on. Uh, I think for me, um, I don't disagree with them on the level that um, there is a particular paradigm of you make a piece of art, you sell it, you make a piece of art, you sell it, in whatever way that might function. The art, the art is a commodity. That you sell, and for myself, uh, I trained as, a, as an actor at drama school, worked as an actor for a long time, and now I work as a writer um, in screenwriting and television writing, and, 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 I'm, and I'm still within that paradigm. And it feels to me the more of this relational art that I take part in, 
the more this feels as something of great value and, and real importance, whereas, you know, the episode of the soap that I might write, that five million people might watch, <coughs> five million people might watch, is of much, 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 much less value. So for me, it, it has really challenged me to rethink my feelings and my opinions about it. So I, I have to say, increasingly, I'm in their camp. Yeah. Mm. And, and I suppose our 25, 25 years birthday party of Volcano Theatre was also a bit of a kind of a watershed for me. I mean, I suppose, it, again, this idea of synchronicity, that mm. things come to you, and I think they talk about it in that, and I'm sure everyone has felt that. It's almost like a time in your life where you need something to happen or a particular conversation. It is presented to you without a lot of effort yourself. It's almost like that sense of openness to synchronicity. So I think this definitely found me rather than I found the interview. Um, at a time where I was really questioning this kind of 25 years of, of uh, um, touring, physical theatre, where you do damage your body, you never see your friends, you don't, ha you know, you're often not there for your mother's funeral because mm -hmm. you might be touring in Sri Lanka at the time and you can't get back. Um, so it's, it is this sense that you feel like you're at the centre of life because you're making art and you feel really alive but it also, because of the form that we have in this society of this is what theatre or this is what art looks like, if you, if you actually do it, or sometimes any level of success, it actually means that you are away from your family, you're away from home, and especially women often it is that choice of going, oh, do I do my art or do I have a child? You know, so, oh, my art is my child, you know. Um, so, so, do you agree with them or don't? To, to, well, I, <laughs> I can never say yes or no to anything. <laughs> <laughs> that. Yes, there's always the third way. Uh, you know, don't say the third way. <laughs> no, there is. You know, Satish Kumar, soil, soul, society, youth, truth, in, uh, truth and goodness. It's always three answers to every question. <laughs> I don't think you're going to get a straight answer on that. Ben, you got a question? Um, one of the things that really strikes me about the piece is uh, the invitation and the challenge to be relational in a very, very deep way. Mm -hmm. Especially the invitation and the challenge to be relational with Earth in, and nature in its kind of full on, pure form. And then, in terms of relational art, the way I see relational art, I understand in particular relationship to my relationship to encounters. Uh, is, is, is art which involves in relationship to the audience, the community, to the person that is creating. So it doesn't exist until that relationship happens. Mm -hmm. There is no art until the relationship actually happens. Mm -hmm. And I suddenly noticed in that thought, as I was being challenged, I was sitting, as we're sitting here, in rows. Yeah. So if, for example, I was doing an exercise, I count to three, everybody turn to their right, across their shoulder, and see who they can see. One, two, three. <laughs> <laughs> so, in this setting, which is traditional theatre setting, mm. I invite us, invite this piece to go into the middle until we can all see each other. Sure, that's mm. So, we really invite them to the centre so that we can see each other as we're experiencing this. That's so, we've come relations with Yeah, thank you. Well, you've got the circle then. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Mm. And, and it's interesting because I was very mindful that a lot of the time I was closing you out over there. So every time I was trying to, and you know, kind of scoot around on the table and kind of, like, aha, I'm looking at her. And then she missed the And of course, you kind of go, oh, that seems a bit odd. It's <laughs> 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 very natural. <laughs> um, but uh, yes, yes. Yeah, that's so, a wonderful. Yeah. That's really wonderful. But, and, and again, I think that there's something relational. I mean, and there's so many different levels of relational, isn't there? And I know in encounters, you, you're really putting that at the heart of everything that you're doing. And, and with this, I suppose the relationship, it's almost a little bit, um, yeah, it, it, it allows us to, to kind of trot around the country and, uh, and spend some time with Lucy or spend some time with Ruth or kind of come to Schumacher. Yeah. So there is a relationship that it's almost like, it feels like with this kind of interconnected universe, that it feels like we are kind of drawing, drawing connections and drawing threads. So in a way, at one level, 
that this is about relationship. But as you say, again, it's, it is put in that very, very kind of traditional theatre kind of format. But I suppose it makes us question that as well, which, which might, might be nice too. But is it redundant? Actually, it's over. The, the time of sitting in rows and watching someone up here is over. The most interesting thing is actually what's going on up here. We got any more time? Loose, no, loose, loose. Just, just to check whether there's one more question, and then there's a question I want to ask you, and then we'll close. Yes, please. <coughs> in your other world, as a writer for soaps, yes. do you find that you, these ideas are beginning to filter through? No. So there's <laughs> no way of melding that at all? No. No, but, but, but I'm, I'm trying. In, in, in some of the things that I'm trying to pitch, I'm trying to pitch ideas about, about this change, because... Because and I wasn't being glib on what I said earlier. You know, that I think for for me, I, I think this change is rarefied. It feels to me as I, as I increasingly through these conversations have and through my relationship with Fern, who is my partner and has been for sixteen years, and she's a seeker, and I'm a can I just stay like that, please, kind of person. So I, I have through all of these things been brought into this, and I think it's very rarefied. And and, and if if you bring it into conversation. In, the, in these forums, it just suddenly comes, yeah, no, we don't, people don't want to, you know, all the things that everybody I hear is, I'm very familiar with, I'm sure. So it, 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 it's trying to Trojan horse it mm. into the dialogue as much as possible. Um, and, and I am very exercised by that because, because the dominant paradigm is, a, is, is destructive and damaging, and, and particularly in so, which is incredibly damaging, I, I think. I think EastEnders is the work of the devil. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so so I'm, I'm doing my best. <laughs> and I know it's a good word. Oh, it looks good. When I. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and when I spoke at the very beginning, I talked about the art of invitation um, and in terms of what was happening here this week. And that. Uh, one of the things that the Art of Invitation is looking at is in response to our big challenges, but also looking very specifically at communities and how we engage creatively ourselves and our communities. And so just one last question really to, to you both, which is that what is so interesting in, in doing Dirt Time is where Rachel and Rob have chosen to go in, in a sort of shamanic sense to kind of take themselves away from the village, as it were, to, and say, oh God, do I have to go back to society? Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's worth just hearing before we move on to our other um, evening conversation, mm -hmm. to hear from you about having taken themselves out, as it were, uh, from certainly from the art world and from their previous homes, away, you know, um, what has happened since this performance? and the connection with Susie Gavlick. I leave you to answer and end with that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So um, when we first started to do this, we contacted Susie Gavlick and she gave us, kindly gave us permission to do this. Uh, and we, we tried to find them. We tried to find Rob and Rachel because of course that's what you would and we found nothing, you know, even via the God of Google. Uh, however, after about a year of doing this, we tried again and we found them. And they have a website. <laughs> wait, wait. They have a website. Uh, they came back. Uh, and they have written books. Um, and we have two of them here. Uh, they did go into five years yeah. of kind of wandering after this. So they really, they, they, after this interview, they kind of went into a really un, uncertain, insecure place. Sort of living hand to mouth, selling t-shirts at festivals, yeah, so five know, years working really in fry kitchens. And, and they, they had given up pretty good. They'd know, given up everything. And they were very, very successful careers. artists. They then, uh, they then found a, uh, a Buddhist-based uh, um, retreat center in North America with a large portion of land attached to it who were prepared to give them a small piece of that land, very distant from the retreat centre, uh, in, the, in the hills, in the forest. They took that land, they dug uh, a yurt, and they lived there together in silent retreat for nine years. Oh my God. And at the end of that nine years, they decided, I don't know how, without talking to each other. <laughs> they just knew <laughs> that it was time to come back. 
Uh, and so they came back, and now they talk. Uh, and they and they have written this wow. book, Water Drawn Before Sunrise, which please do come and have a look at. There's images of the art that they describe in the piece, uh, uh, which is their story. They also, uh, well, there are three books, one of which we forgot to bring, uh, and this one, Luminous Heart of Inner Radiance. Th they don't have a shop on their website, I'm delighted to tell you. <laughs> it just says there are some books, and there's lots of their thoughts and teachings. And this book, um, they make art again. And in this book... Hooray! Well, this book, I think they do again. This was, maybe this was their kind uh, and the, of... This book, the, this book, and again, please do come and have a look. This is um, the visions they saw when they were in their nine-year retreat. But where, can, where, where are these going to be? These are going to be... Well, we're going to move this, so maybe if yes. we put them on the table... Is that table at the back still there? Or, okay. or yeah. maybe if we just leave this here. Yes. Uh, so lots and lots of images of the visions that they saw, uh, and I just quickly, thank you, for, uh, like to finish with this. Dear Fern and Phil, thank you for your beautiful letters and for sharing with us your journeys through our words. We are deeply touched by your experiences and the dialogue that our words are still generating. Uh, yes, we would be happy if you continue the performances, especially now that you can connect, connect the dialogue with our current work. Um, hang on, there we are. The basic issue for us remains the same as it was in the Dirt Time interview. Whether in the context of art or spiritual practice, the challenge of coming into direct experience and sacred relationship with the fabric of being without the distortions of culture. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, you are in our hearts, mm -hmm. Rob and Rachel. So, um, so what um, we, Ruth, uh, myself, and Marie, and I want to invite uh, Fazana and Alan to join us. That they are also teaching and contributing to the Art of Invitation course, as is um, playwright and campaigner Sarah Woods, who I think is on her way. So if we spot her coming through an open door, uh, we will ask her to join us um, um, as well. Um, and Rachel said at the very beginning that I had uh, been here seven years ago, which is very true. And um, just to say uh, just a few words about what brings me here is that having spent my week at Schumacher, I, I went away with my heart and soul and head simply ringing and ringing and ringing. And as a consequence of being here, but also connecting with Totnes and Transition in its early days, um, I went back to where I lived in Tooting and thought very deeply about the questions that, that Rachel and Rob have just been asking about, is there time to make art? Um, and you know what is the role? Does art have a role? Um, and in my experience of working locally in Tooting, where I live in South London, the process of transition, in other words, the process of facilitating a creative process in the public realm to imagine uh, how a different future could could be created, if we first imagine it, and that has to be a public, active, conscious process. I realised that my own background in the arts, if you like what we call today my sort of root ball, um, I used to run an international theatre festival, was absolutely relevant to this other story about how we created a, a different narrative, a new narrative. Um, and that is what has, has brought me here as a result of deciding that there is a very clear and distinct practice emerging around, if you like, what I have called a transitional arts practice which is very much about people and story and place and the connections and when you bring creativity and intentional change together. Um, and um, literally uh, in the last few days um, have put a book together, Playing for Time, which has brought 62 contributors together, looking at how we join these stories of practice, what are its principles, how do we make it more visible. Um, and it is, if you like, a sort of transition book of the arts, as I mentioned, and it's also called Making Art as if the world mattered, which in fact is, is also uh, a Susie Gablick, and I like the line we're doing at that time about seek not the men of old, but seek what they sought, and, and you know, we have been a great seeker of what it was that Susie Gablick was seeking for. But that's really just a run-up 
for me to say that amongst the contributors that I've been working with on playing for time, um, two of those are um, people that are here. One is Ruth and one is Anne-Marie. And I can honestly say, really, in my experience of working with them and collaborating, that if we're looking for a practice which is able to engage people creatively and to make things happen, and some of the invitations that were given for the course here were, are you trying to encourage people to respond to the social and ecological challenges of our time and become active in the world? Uh, would you like to explore more creative ways of engaging communities? And would you like to explore how making art together can accelerate change? Um, that, that both Ruth and Anne-Marie um, are, I think, absolute pioneers. And just, just the sort of few minutes that you've just had of experience in your own way of sort of uh, joining in and picking up that invitation. So to give you a sense, and amongst you are the 17 participants that we've got on the course with us, um, I will ask Fazana and Alan in turn to talk a bit about their own work and, and joining us for this course. But first, I wanted to talk to Ruth and to Anne-Marie for you to give us a sense of what brought you here in terms of just a little bit about your background, in terms of your, you know, what motivates your work and what brought you to this point here. Uh, I'll ask you first, Ruth, and then ask Anne-Marie. Um, so, I mean, I, I hope that we can talk and then we hear a bit more from all of you because it's really nice to hear that space. I mean, my, I, I have a background um, as a theatre maker and I also have a, a longer background as a child brought up um, by parents who were very politically involved and who in a way passed on to me the idea that even as a child or as a young person that I kind of had a responsibility um, and I'm very grateful for that and at times that has felt like a burden um, and other times I've found my own way with what that means for me to be an agent in the world. So I've always felt that and um, my background was as a theatre director and I spent 10 years making theatre um, in a way that Fern was talking about there. I kind of collaborated at times with scientists and I was always interested in questions really. Um, and then 10 years ago, I had that moment of like, I need to get out of this system that I'm in because I need to be out, I need to be out there. Um, and I need to bring together some of my, I suppose, feeling of responsibility that I, that I have a role to play in change um, and my own creative exploration. And so really for the last 10 years, um, I've been using that kind of... Um, that training and that ability to craft or shape something. And in a way, um, I've, I've now spent the last 10 years designing the frame and designing an invitation that allows other people to create, to provide the content. Um, and that's a big shift. You know, when, when I was at making theatre, I was very much, I was grappling with questions. But I would shape the whole thing and it would be like, right now I want you to see this moment. And now it's much more about actually how do I place myself in relationship with other people, with places, to create a frame that people can add to. And so um, I set up Encounters Arts 10 years ago in Sheffield with, a, with another arts practitioner called Trish O'Shea. And we started by taking over a disused shop. And we've taken over 10 shops since then. And in a way learned on the job. Um, at the, about the art of invitation and the art of holding a space and a process that allows people to come and leave a trace of themselves behind and to, to find a way to relook at their places, their neighbourhoods, their communities. And, uh, you know, a shop threshold is very exciting because it's like everyone kind of knows the rules and it's a threshold that's, that's quite easy to step over. And I'm, and I'm very interested in the thresholds that those of us who are holding space or who, or who are inviting people to take part into the projects, we were talking about it earlier. And for me, it's like it feels like the participant or the person I'm inviting to, to have a dialogue with about something. It feels to me like their step should be really, really easy. And my step perhaps needs to, could be is the one that needs to journey to really look at, I'm the one who, who takes myself and my craft in, in finding a way that for somebody else, it's just, it's, it's a step. 
So quite a lot of the work, and I work with councils, and, and most of the, a lot of the work I've been doing for the last 10 years and that we've been doing with Encounters is kind of commissioned, not necessarily from, by arts organisations, but it's also commissioned through local council, through regeneration, through voluntary service, through health, through education, through environmental, using this possibility to say creative processes can be intensely transformational and powerful in bringing communities together across difference to really have these conversations about what's it like to live now and what world do we want to create together. So underpinning all of that work, in a way, that's been the things that, that, that I've been exploring. And um, just briefly, in a way, what I think have evolved is this one methodology which is on the street. So a lot of the work we do is kind of on the street, is setting up a series of what we call invitations to join in, in a street, out in a hospital, in a car park, <coughs> in a market, in a shop, that allow people who are passing by that we're kind of interrupting or offering a, a break, perhaps in that, in that routine, just to say hello, just to have a conversation, to find ways of asking people to join in. That's a whole set of work. And often that's quite a mass way of doing it. We can get hundreds of people who can have that moment um, of, of connection. <coughs> really. And then another set of work, which is about trying to bring communities together across difference over a longer period of time. So for an example, a project that Anne-Marie and I have collaborated on together for the last six years is that we brought an intergenerational community groups together to grow a garden, to talk about climate change, to talk about resource depletion, to make a performance about their relationship with themselves, each other, and the wider natural world. And that's where we can model and bring together a community to say, maybe it could be like this. So I think both of those are an approach that we've done to that art of invitation. Um, over the last 10 years and we're based in Totnes and we work um, nationally and we do some international work as well in um, Israel and Palestine that Ben, who's an associate, leads on as well. That's a little bit around that. Um, so um, I'm Anne-Marie and my work stems from my uh, deep fascination and um, I guess hunger for learning and deepening my connection with the wider than human world and um, and then seeing how that relationship can be active and then brought to share with other people. So um, I started out as a geographer and then I confronted um, sort of climate change and a lot of information, statistical information around things which I just didn't want to deal with, age 20. And I then went into the art, socially engaged arts field and I had this uh, sort of burning feeling that I needed to bring that experience of shock and uh, try and unpick why I was so affected by that moment where I looked at a Sunday supplement and saw an image and read about something <coughs> that was happening invisibly. Mm -hmm. um, in my society and I started out that journey tentatively as an artist that made work in response to site so I did a number of uh, residencies on national parks on Arthur's Seat which is a beautiful monument that has multiple layers of meanings and I invited a lot of other people to share their stories and their interpretations of that site which were layered in an exhibition and a booklet which was free given away to people to celebrate that site and then I kept stepping towards what I really wanted to look at, which was this engaged sort of dynamic relationship to ecology and how that related to society and how that was damaged and that relationship was damaged and fragmented. And so I guess that's a bit of background to my work, which um, this uh, poster here just illustrates the great turning, which is a phrase used by Joanna Macy. And she... Very, so just very quickly introduce this idea that she um, <coughs> divides sort of the, the ways that you can work towards a more life-sustaining society as opposed to an supporting an industrial growth society. Uh, there's three different ways of doing that. And one of those is through holding actions, which is more around activism and trying to stop something which is quite obviously causing damage and destruction on a global context. Um, and 
There's also the second, which is creating alternative structures, so structures that are more democratic and consensus-based, that are different to the structures in place, which are causing damage and destruction. And the third is around um, projects that work around shifting consciousness, so people can open up to a different form of identity, which might involve um, the more than human community that we live in, so our ecological identity. And my work oscillates like a bee between those three categories and I can't, it never sits within one of those because each of those for me kind of support one of the other. So I have been engaged in quite direct activism but I can't do that all the time. Um, and I don't want to do that all the time because at other times I want to do something which is more nurturing and, um, and more positive and creates different structures and creates places that I want to call home and places I want to be in with other people. So a lot of that's around an active relationship with land through food and food growing and, and planting trees and then all the different conversations that can come out of the act of putting a tree in the ground that's going to be there for 100 years' time, growing fruit, perhaps, which is going to affect your, the way your economy works and your social groups work and your community potentially works. So... Um, and then the third category, the shift of consciousness, um, it was really interesting hearing doing dirt time because earlier today we did a, a root of my practice is something called field sensing, which is a slow walking practice, which is around trying to just slow down to be able to listen again to some of the other rhythms that are going on around me. And that feeds and supports me and it's more like a kind of meditation or opening up part of my practice um, and it fits with all the others in a kind of nice jangly messy mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> thank you That's me. so Fazana activist alternative systems shift of values can you just give us a sense of your own work that you're doing um, so currently I, I work at Platform London, which is an environmental um, justice and social justice organisation. We work across art, education, activism and research, so we're a very multidisciplinary organisation. Within that, we all have different projects, um, which all in, interlink. Some people work on the carbon web, some work on external energy, people work on cultural licence, um, trying to end art sponsorship um, from oil companies. I particularly work on a radical pedagogy or education project around race, power and media. And within that, I guess one of our, our missions is to reimagine what justice looks like. A lot of things that um, Lucy already touched on, new narratives, including narratives that are um, bypassed, looking at our colonial um, histories and how that links to power structures and penciling those pa power structures that have been made invisible through capitalism, through environmental destruction some of the issues that we look at and I guess um, the project started or the, the impetus for that the project um, in 2010 uh, we were looking at I wasn't there at the time but um, platform was looking at um, the case study of Ken Sarawiwa the Nigerian activist and writer and playwright and Stephen Lawrence and looking at you know what are the parallels how can something like this take place and the impact on culture and art and, and society as a whole when these kind of atrocities take place. So we, we tend to frame our work within justice and always looking at those issues, but a lot of what Anne-Marie says touches into to what Platform does, where we do direct actions or holding actions, we're trying to campaign against specific things, and then we're looking at alternative structures, reimagining one of the things that we're looking at at the moment is um, energy beyond neoliberalism, so that's quite an exciting project. And then also the, the conscious, the paradigm shift, the shift within the conceptual space um, is another aspect of what we try and do. Thank you very much and welcome. To Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, Alan, you are very familiar here at Schumacher and Dartington, so welcome to you. Um, and is the time to make art anymore? Uh, well, no, I, I, I do think, of course, it's the time. I mean, I, I, I wasn't sure what I was going to say, or even what the question was going to be, but um, 
I suppose I, I've come back to Dartington again and again. Um, so I'm, I currently work at the University of Brighton. I'm head of research for the School of Art, Design, Media and Architecture. But most of my life seems to bring me back here. And um, I think for good reason, because remarkable things have happened here. I mean, we were talking at um, dinner, a couple of us, um, about making art in places where maybe it was um, disallowed or, or made illegal in, 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 under dictatorship. And today I met with uh, someone that p people might know well, Sam Richards, who, who is based in, in Dartington. And we were talking about the history of the college. And I was saying, well, the thing that I've just started looking at is a series of meetings that happened in 1944 in Dartington called the Dartington Review. And it was Clement Attlee coming down to Dartington and meeting, meeting with people like Michael Young and various other people. people in the room who know more about this than me. But, you know, I remember bringing one of the directors of Arts Council down to Dartington and taking her to the archive and pointing at five box files and saying, you know, there's a record of some conversations there. And out of that series of conversations came the Labour Party manifesto for 1945, came the Welfare State, came the NHS, came the Arts Council, and vitally, in many ways, in terms of the arts, came the arts, uh, the arm's length principle. And I was thinking about that today at dinner. You know, the arm's length principle basically born out of the need to say that the arts need to be independent. You know, we've just seen in the Second World War the arts co-opted mm -hmm. to serve the, the Nazis or even the, you know, the emerging Soviet state. And um, it was clear that that couldn't happen anymore, but that the arts would need support because they are vital to our sense of who we are, to our sense of community, to our sense of being. And um, vital also to challenge us. And uh, it, we knew at that point that we couldn't trust the state. And so the arm's length principle was born, partly in Dartington. So what a place to be. Uh, in a place that generated those conversations. And also, in many ways, I, I've kind of, in my work, been revisiting places like the Bauhaus, Dartington, and Black Mountain College. I did a project with Arnold Feeney, which was one of the things that took me away from Dartington, which is to go and work as head of research on Feeney. It was um, Caroline Collier, then coming, who was then director of Arnold Feeney, who would become director of Tate National, coming down because she wanted to write Dartington into history because she thought it had been forgotten that when the Bauhaus was closed, that people had to flee, they had to come and find another home, and they were given a home here. And that's quite remarkable, and that they would then some of them move on and found Black Mountain College, you know, these radical arts communities that would have such an effect on, on culture and our, our sense of who we are in many places across the world. And some of the work I did here, you know, you know some people might have been aware of the arts and ecology program I, I put together here, it was trying to engage with some of that history and revisit what I thought was at the heart of the radical project that started to, you know, at the times that it forgets. Um, I was, you know, just finally, just a brief thought on the, on the piece that we heard. I was very struck, you know, the opening line talked about the numinous, you know, which I think, and again, I'm sure there are plenty of people in the room who know what numinous is. I vaguely remember that it might be something about glowing with an inner sense of the sacred or some, some sort of presence of the sacred. But then it talked about the everyday. And I thought uh, of, at that point of, of Joseph Boyce, who was a kind of, uh, you know, a mentor in a way for, for Platform. I know, I know Platform very well. And, you know, for me, what was vital about Joseph Boyce, one of the, the radical things that he did was in many ways to uh, collapse the, dis, the sort of the split between matter and spirit in the moment in, in a an arts festival where he said, you know, you can think of material like clay, and he knew clay very well, and you can press your thumb into clay and you can feel the quality of resistance, the texture, the impurities, you get a sense of the material. Surely we can do this in conversation. And he made a conversation entry into that space and felt the quality of resistance as he started to talk about radical ego politics. And of course he could now then say, well, maybe we can think about conversation as material. And I think that was a radical move, and a very influential move, and probably something that we're engaged with in, in, in this course. But equally, well, he talked about transforming the, the everyday, and I, I think, you know, back to the luminous, uh, I also thought about uh, alchemy, and again, I've probably got a few alchemists in the room, so you, you know a lot more than this, uh, about this than me. But my, in my reading of the alchemists, particularly on, on a book by James Elkins, the, uh, the, what painting is, 
But he talks about um, how the alchemists often were working really with the everyday, with stuff that was every around them all the time, stuff like piss and shit, and that they were collecting this and working on it to try and turn it into something extraordinary. But it was, it was about the overlooked, the stuff that wasn't noticed, the stuff that was forgotten, and turning that into something remarkable, so, so that transformational process. And, you know, something which I don't usually announce to, to um, you know, uh, a, 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 in a public setting, but our, my youth was all about gang violence. I was, you know, you know, in a pretty miserable situation. And in many ways, art is something that I committed to because it helped me to transform my everyday. And I thought about the fifth piece. Now, the question I would have asked you was that about repeating the thing again and again and again. Because, I mean, one part of my experience of Darlington was taking the same walk almost every day. And I think there is something about repetition and encountering the familiar again and again and noticing that it changes and continues, you know, we, we encounter discontinuous change all the time, and that transforms our every day. And some of that is done through repetition, maybe repeating the same words again and again. And that repetition felt consistent with the idea of the piece, I think. So noticing maybe something new in the text. Or, yeah. so I suppose that's what my yeah. work is about. Thank you. No, thank you, Alan. Thank you very much. And um, just at the right moment, um, Sarah Woods has arrived. And so, Sarah, although you've just walked through the door, <laughs> we're going to invite you um, to join us here if you want to find a perch on the table. Um, and just to set the scene for you, which I think you can very well imagine, um, that we have had a performance this evening of Doing Dirt Time. Um, and we can announce that Sarah has played Susie Gablick herself. And um, we're just really introducing ourselves in terms of sort of where we come from, in terms of our own practice, and the kind of questions that we've been asking about, you know, is the time to make art anymore? Um, and what is the creative response that, you know, we can have on a daily basis to these big planetary big challenges that we're looking at. So that, that's quite a sort of big schema to come into, yeah. but um, I know you're up to it. So yeah. I would just like, if I may, just to ask you just to introduce yourselves to people here okay. and in terms of the kind of the key things that kind of motivating you and that bring you here tonight and welcome. Thank you. Well, there's, there's a thousand ways of saying the same thing really, isn't there? but I suppose what I was struck by listening to Alan was the idea of conversation and resistance, the, the sort of lump of play that he talked about. And, I think that's what I'm engaged in really, is trying to work with communities, work with all sorts of different people, as many different, as wide ranging groups of people as possible, in order to, you know, not find the, the root of least resistance, but to try and find how we can work together. And um, I work, my sort of lens on this, I suppose, is story. I'm a playwright, and that's my background is theatre, <coughs> and very much like Alan, that was, you know, I found sort of theatre, youth theatre when I was um, quite young and that was my way of seeing the world I think. So I've used that lens to, to look at story, to look at narrative in different ways of using story and narrative and um, that can be a sort of creation of a live narrative so in the sort of um, direct action work, work uh, so I did some work on fracking bringing together all the different elements of a community from sort of, sort of frackers themselves to very angry community activists and trying to get people in a room and create a live narrative that everybody can be part of. Um, or it might be a story that is gathered from a, a load of different people within a community and that turned into something that's presented back to them, so sort of more community-derived work or stuff that I sort of make up at home on my own but in relationship to charities, to scientists, to all sorts of different people. So I work with story in lots and lots of different ways um, and I suppose that's in essence, what I'm interested in is those basic elements of our story, um, from the very, very small and personal to the very, very big, and how we can connect those and distill them in order to make sense of them for ourselves and also to make sense of others for ourselves, which I think is probably the thing that I think is most important at the moment, is how do we best understand. And I think to do that, we often need to start from where we are. So that's, I could do that again probably 50 times and it's different each time, but that's one sort of go through. That's, that's thank, you. thank you very, very much, Sarah. And one of the things that we've been trying to do, um, if you like, as, a, as a, a community of practice, and that includes the people that have joined us on the course, is to 
look at the commonalities of the way we're working. That means that often working in very different settings, you've heard that, you know, this isn't necessarily a painting in a gallery or a play in a theatre. This is work that's happening in neighbourhoods, in allotments, you know, in prisons, in hospitals, in streets. It's, it's you know, it's, it's kind of can be possibly a bit hidden and therefore uh, making it very visible and also identifying what its very particular qualities are something has been drawn out about that it's interdisciplinary it, it kind of moves between uh, what you know it, it doesn't sort of stay still